Hey everyone, Kaijin Goomba here. You know, I still find it amazingly strange that we went from being completely nihilistic about the new Super Mario Bros. movie by Illumination to just... Man, even I'm hyped for it now. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you prove you understand your source material. Seeing all the retro references in the handful of trailers is one thing, but creating an entire faux commercial, advertising an actual functioning site filled with easter eggs all set to the Super Mario Bros. Super Show theme? Now you have my attention. As well as the attention of all of our patrons who are hooked on the brothers just as much as we are right now. And I think I got just the thing to talk about. Wait, we're going back to the Tanuki suit again? Dude, we've been talking about this thing ever since our first video back in 2012. Why it turns into a Jizo statue, why the old version has a red scarf, the association it has with leaves and transforming. We even took an unrelated swing at explaining Tanuki's giant balls as a metallurgy joke through it. Yeah, but there's one thing we haven't yet talked about. Why it lets Mario fly? A question I and a few others started asking again after watching Mario zipping around in the second movie trailer. What is it specifically about Tanuki and Raccoon Mario that lets him fly? Uh, we kinda already know that one. And have known for a while. Back in 2011 during E3, Yoshiaki Koizumi and Takashi Tezuka clarified the whole process in designing the Tanuki suit. The site Tezuka? So actually, the idea for the Tanuki suit came originally from wanting to put a tail on Mario, and so we start off by putting a tail on Mario in Super Mario Bros. 3, and we wanted to use that tail so he could do a little spin move and hit his enemies with his tail as a sort of an attack. But then once we had the tail on Mario, we thought, we've got this great tail, isn't there something else we can do with it? So then the next thing we started to do was to have the tail kind of flutter back and forth, and we thought that's more like a propeller, so the flutter motion would make Mario a little bit lighter so we could jump further. But once we started doing that, it felt so good we said, let's just make him fly. And all of that checks out when you look at the old Japanese ads for Mario 3 as the titular plumber is spinning that raccoon tail around and around like tails from Sonic. Yeah, I don't know if I buy that. That's not to say that Tezuka was lying, but I mean, come on. When it comes to Nintendo, we know how cheekily aloof these devs can get. It took Miyamoto 28 years to admit to the premise of Mario 3 as being a stage play, and he also explained just how much the Fushimi Inari Shrine and all of its local folklore inspired Star Fox. So forgive me for putting on my tinfoil hat, but I don't think the coincidence of, oh, he's got a tail, eh, let's make him fly, was the only thing that inspired this game mechanic. And I've got just a theory to prove it, with a big thanks to my bud Andre for dropping this breadcrumb trail. Ta-da! The heck is this? This ain't a Tanuki. It's not even a canid. It looks more like some kind of pygmy leopard. This is the Hong Li, or Wind Wildcat, a rather colorful Chinese cryptid of blues, greens, and yellows with a leopard pattern going down its back. Some accounts have said that it looks more like a monkey, others say cat, or otter, or rabbit, so it's a bit of a mishmash either way. But regardless of what animal it may look like, all accounts of the creature have stated that it's no bigger than a domestic dog or cat. Though it was officially chronicled in the Bin Sao Gong Mu, or Compendium of Materia Medica, a record book that analyzes and describes all manner of animals, plants, materials, and basically all things that have medicinal properties. And the heck medicinal properties did the Feng Li have? Uh, its piss is apparently milk that can cure leprosy. Ha <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. So, wait. What does it have to do with Tanuki? Well, here, check out the Feng Li's name in Chinese one more time. You see anything familiar? Hold on, that's the kanji for Tanuki right freaking there. Is this another instance of Japan trying to adapt another quadruped to its folklore and then just calling it a Tanuki? From what I researched, yeah. See, when it comes to folklore creatures and yokai in Japan, if it's not native to Japan or it's so old that people forgot its origin, it usually ends up as an offshoot Tanuki or Kappa. In the Tanuki's case, the Mujina and the Kitsune, two very distinct yokai, were at one point just tossed into the Tanuki pile as their folklore came to Japan from China. And when it comes to a lot of obscure yokai, such as the Ashiarashi Yashiki, Nobigari, Mikoshi Nyudo, and a dozen others, people would just claim that it's those wacky shapeshifting Tanuki playing pranks again. But the Fu Li didn't even get that much of a connection. See, when the Ben Gangmu made its way to Japan during the Edo period for advancement in the medical field, Apparently folks just didn't know how to process this creature. The current theory behind this thing is that it's based off of the Kalugo of Southeast Asia, but considering Japan is a relatively isolated nation, far and away from this creature's habitat, no such creature ever made its way up there. So to my understanding, they saw the kanji of Fung Li and translated it to the Onyomi pronunciation of Furi or Kaze Tanuki in the Kunyomi reading. So here's yet another mythical creature from China going in the Tanuki pile. 
I guess no one in Japan considered that the Li part of the name could refer to a wildcat in Chinese. Ever since, the creature's been popping up in all manner of Edo period yokai compendiums like Toriyama Sekien's Kon Shaku Hyaki Shui and Terajima Ryoan's Wakan San Saizue. And then finally, all pretense was dropped as Hokusai put out his own interpretation of the Fudi in his Hokusai manga. No, not that kind of manga. I mean a 15 volume series of sketches on all things natural and supernatural that he published back in 1814. And this thing just looks like a really long tanuki now. So that's how we went from something that looked like a cat to something that was just literally a tanuki. Ah, uh, such is the fickle nature of Edo Piri postmodernism. It was quite a journey, but all right, I can get behind this bizarre evolution from Fung Li to Fudi. But what about the real concept you've been dancing around for the last five minutes? What about the concept of a flying tanuki? That has everything to do with the behavior of the Fudi. It was believed that the creature would soar high into the air, jumping from treetop to treetop and even mountain peak to mountain peak, able to do so by capturing wind around its body and making it fly up as the air rose up. As it says in the Binsao Gang Mu, at night, because of the wind, it leaps swiftly, jumping over rocks and trees, like birds flying in the air. This is most easily explained by comparing it to its likely real-life source, the aforementioned Kalugo, a so-called flying lemur that actually is the most capable of all mammalian gliders, and considering this thing could get 16 inches in length and 4 pounds in weight, that would be roughly the size of a small tanuki when compared. And considering tanuki have long been known to climb trees, yeah, I could see that connection. But here's the kicker, gang, and the reason why I think this connection between the foodie and the tanuki suit is just a little too coincidental. Tanuki Mario and Raccoon Mario cannot fly. Shut up, the P-Wing doesn't count. That's its own independent ultra-rare power-up. Seriously, think about it. Mario runs on the ground for a bit, putting his hands out, and then leaps into the air, going up and up and up and up, then gliding back down by spinning his tail. The old school Fudi lore states that the wind tanuki is able to leap and glide from tree to tree and mountain to mountain by manipulating the wind around it, letting it glide to its destination. Heck, I'll do you one better! In later iterations of the tanuki suit in Mario games, Mario doesn't even get the upward lift anymore. He simply glides by holding out his arms and kicking his feet. Now, if you want to say that all this is coincidental gameplay mechanics, that's fine, but come on, man! Are you seriously telling me that the folks who have been shoving in Japanese folklore in Mario game after Mario game since 3 didn't use this incredibly obvious connection? I'm on to you, Miyamoto! Whoa, slow down there, buddy. But, you know, that actually got me thinking. In New Super Mario Bros. U, we got a brand new power-up in the form of the Super Acorn and Flying Squirrel Mario. If the foodie are based on Kalugos, and Kalugos are basically South Asian flying squirrels, doesn't that mean it's possible that the Mario devs just used the foodie folklore twice over to create another gameplay mechanic curiously similar to the Raccoon Tail? J I... You... Miyamoto! God, I can't believe this! Well, while he sorts that one out, big thanks to everyone who voted to bring this guy's cultural brain hemorrhaging to life. Don't worry, he'll be fine. He actually goes through this two or three times a week. And we got a juicy idea coming up for Witch Ninja too, and those always cheer him up. And a big thank you to Audrey for giving us this breadcrumb trail. This was a doozy of a topic. And finally, a big thank you all for watching. If you want to learn even more about culture and games, sub up, get notified, and swing back every other week for a new video. So, until next time everyone! Ah, this is Gaijin Kumba signing out!